What is it like to sue the U.S. government? They had a committee that was the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, and if you looked at it, there were 11 people on it, six had financial relationships with industry. That's not right. My guest today is Dr. Neil Barnard, the American nutrition researcher, author, and health advocate. You're a professor of medicine. You're constantly writing new books. You're the founder of the Barnard Medical Center. You're the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. How do you get it all done? You know, you've seen the light, so to speak, and no longer are you an advocate of beef. And why is that? If you're not eating meat, the arteries open up again. These diseases are reversible. If we don't take that in our hands, we're condemning our kids to repeat what's happened to too many in our generation. So Dr. Barnard, it's a total pleasure to sit down and talk with you about kind of your background and your interest in nutrition. And I've just been consuming your content for years and it's really cool to be able to have the opportunity to sit down and actually talk through some of my questions. So thank you so much for making the time. Well, thank you, Leif. I'm glad you could be here. Thanks. So your grandfather was in the cattle business and so was his father and your father decided to kind of take a different path. He didn't want to get into the cattle business and he was instead interested in going to medical school. So he did that. He became an expert in diabetes. And when you went to medical school, you were really only interested in studying the brain or at least That's at right. the beginning. So what inspired you to shift focus to the whole body and eventually pursue in your father's footsteps and focus some of your research on diabetes? The year before I went to medical school, I had a job at Fairview Hospital. And part of my job was to be in the morgue. Uh, whenever a patient died in the hospital, I would take the body out of the cooler and put them on the table where the pathologist would do an exam. And the pathologist would show me heart disease and strokes and all of these things. And I would get kind of a lecture, you know, every day about the things that can go wrong in our body. And so although I went to medical school with the idea of looking at, at the brain and what goes wrong with it and human behavior and all that sort of thing, I had this early introduction to what goes wrong with the body and also perhaps how our family business might have contributed to all of that with all the cholesterol that our family had been producing over the years. Yeah, I remember you talking about this one specific example when you're in the morgue and you open up this body cavity and whoever you were with at the time, I guess your your mentor showed you what plaque buildup looks like in the arteries. And yeah. then you put the the body back together. You kind of stitched up the ribs and then you went and you saw ribs in the cafeteria. And it was just kind of a really it was a really polarizing kind of moment for you. The ribs in the cafeteria looked like the body. They smelled like the body. And I suddenly realized this is the body. <laughs> I didn't become a vegetarian on the spot, but I, there was no way I could eat that. Um, and it planted a seed in my mind. And as time went on, I started to learn more about how foods affect what we eat. And, and of course, the broader issues, you know, how foods affect the planet and everything else. So you've said if you are a physician, either you are a vegan or you just haven't read the literature. Why do so many physicians seemingly ignore the obvious literature and the findings that you and others have worked on? Well, the good news is there are a lot more doctors who are up to date than there ever were before. Um, it used to be there were kind of a handful, but now there are so many doctors who say, this is the power that we have against heart disease and against cancer and diabetes and so forth. That said, there are a whole lot who are just way behind the times. It's a, a troubling thing is because nutrition is not taught in medical school. It's not on the board exams. And for a busy practice, a lot of doctors just think, I don't have time. I don't want to get into it. It's easier for the doctor to write a prescription. And in my view, that does a tremendous disservice to the patient because the cause of what they are suffering from in so many cases, whether it's a high cholesterol or high blood pressure or whatever, it's often because of the diet they've been following. And you can change that. And you can revolutionize their health in a matter of days or weeks um, by addressing the cause. And you're never going to get that way. You're never going to get that result if you just use a Band-Aid in the form of a prescription. Yeah, I love that metaphor, a band using a Band-Aid to just 
put over a gaping wound that has not actually fully been addressed. So what can we do to really get at the root cause of these issues instead of just slapping something to mask whatever symptoms a patient is experiencing? And I think that's really important. Yeah, you know, our job, of course, here is to do research studies, to show what nutrition can do, to prove it, um, and in some cases to question it. Um, we have to really have the data and it has to be correct and honest. And then we have to make sure that we're getting the word out to the people who can use it, whether they are people with illnesses or the doctors who are treating them. Yeah, so a lot of that work that you do is through the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So can you discuss your work with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and your efforts to promote plant-based nutrition within the medical community? Sure, well, I founded the Physicians Committee back in 1985. And ever since then, we've just grown and grown and grown. And, and we have, um, all kinds of materials on our website, of course, but we have classes for the, the public, classes for health professionals, and we work a lot with the government and with decision-making bodies to push them to promote healthy eating to the extent that they can. So the, yeah, mid-1980s, that was definitely even more behind the times in terms of nutrition within the medical community. So what kind of pushback did you receive in those early days? I know you're still receiving pushback in, <laughs> in various ways, but yeah. I imagine it was even more significant in the early days. Well, in 1985, people didn't use the word vegan. And if they used it, they didn't know how to pronounce it. It was, you know, vegan or yeah. that kind of stuff. And if you went to a health food store, I got to tell you, you know, if you would buy soy milk, it was a powder. You had to mix, I'm not kidding. You'd have to mix it up with water and pour it on your cereal before it would precipitate. And you know, things, things have come a long ways since that time. But then as now, our second biggest adversary was industry. I mean, there's a lot of money behind a cheeseburger. The dairy industry is making the cheese, the meat industry is making the meat, and the fast food industry is making profit from all that stuff. They do not give way gladly to um, a completely different business model. But the biggest issue we have really is just this sort of, um, for want of a better word, sort of the sluggishness of the human spirit. I smoked all my life. I'm not going to quit now. I've eaten this all my life. It's hard for me to quit now. My family uh, raised me this way. I'm not going to quit now. That said, there are people changing their diets and doing so gladly, um, but not necessarily in the best direction. There are people who give up carbs. They don't eat fruit, they don't eat grains, they don't eat beans, they, don't, they, they give up so many things. You know, for them, the idea of having a bowl of cereal for breakfast is a sin because it's carbs. And it's, they're really kind of suffering, thinking they're doing something good. So my point is to say that people are, in fact, willing to make changes. They're just often maybe not <laughs> the best changes. And if they learn how to do it the right way, they suddenly get this humongous payoff. It was something I had to learn. And it's something that everyone has to learn too. So growing up, you were exposed to the cattle industry, the meat industry. You have said before that you have hunted. You used to drive cattle to slaughter. And you also used to consume a lot of meats. That was kind of the culture that you grew up in. So obviously, you've made a total 180 uh, over the course of your life. What, how do we help other people have those 180s in their life? What do you think is the, the mechanism there? You know, I think the changes that people make often start with a need that they feel. Um, for most people, it's some kind of health issue. And it could be I'm gaining more weight than I want, um, or my cholesterol is up, or I've had a heart issue, or, or something like that. Um, many, many people have some health issue or, or other. Then they have to learn how does diet contribute to that? It may not. I mean, if the, if the problem they have is a torn meniscus, you know, that's not a dietary issue. Um, but for so many of the things that we're dealing with in modern practice, it is. Once they learn that, we use two steps to help them. First of all, they have to understand how diet is going to affect it. Okay, my cholesterol is up because there's cholesterol in meat. And there's saturated fat in meat that causes my body to make more cholesterol. Simple facts but people need to know them. Once they know that, step one is just to take about a week. This is what we do in the clinic. We give people about a week to explore the options of what they could eat if they were leaving the animal products aside, keeping oily stuff low. And so they'll figure, okay, uh, oatmeal, 
with some cinnamon and raisins. All right, that's fine. Or pancakes without the butter. Or instead of scrambling eggs, I could scramble tofu. If you like it, if, if it, you know, you, you try these things. If you like it, you put it on the list. And after a week, people always have a huge list of stuff that, that works for them. Step two, three-week test drive. You just jump in, do it all vegan all the time. But we say three weeks. Oh, really? I could do anything for three weeks. And secondly, I've already got my list. Um, so we use that um, little bit of a short immersion. And people do really well. At the end of three weeks, physically, they're changing. They're losing weight. They're feeling better. And then their tastes are changing. Haven't had chicken wings in three weeks. I don't miss them. Okay, great. Let's go on from here. It's amazing how quickly your body can adapt. And I love hearing stories of people who go from struggling with their health to thriving on plants. And I think uh, a lot of the work that you're doing is um, obviously helping a lot of people in that way. What are you most proud of accomplishing up to this point with PCRM? Well, our work is not done, but we've done a number of important things. I think f for one thing, we worked on the U.S. government to change the dietary guidance. Um, back when we started, there was four food groups, meat, dairy, vegetables and fruits, and grains. That was it. The pyramid came in, um, which was better in some ways, but not good enough. And in 2009, we sued the U.S. government to replace it with a plate. It took them two years to do it. But when they did, the current plate is very similar to what we suggested. It kicks out the meat group, replaced it with a protein group, and it adds dairy. But um, it, it's not perfect. But for the first time in American history, there is no meat group. The government does not say you've got to have meat at all. That's good. Uh, secondly, we were able to look at diabetes in a whole new light. Um, Diabetes is not caused by having a soda in the morning or having a cupcake at dinner or having toast or carbohydrate in general. It's caused by the buildup of fat inside muscle and liver cells. That is totally news to most people. But we have shown, which really was not evident before that, that diabetes is a two-way street. You get it? You've had it four, five, six, eight years. You change your diet now. The fat starts coming out of the cells. Now the sugar can get into the cell where it belongs. Your blood sugar comes down. Your diabetes gets better and better and better. And there's some people who say goodbye to this diagnosis, which we thought was absolutely impossible when I was in medical school. We now know it's something you can do every day. Um, I, I, don't get me wrong. I mean, some people have had their bodies really throttled by this disease, and they may only come so far. But let's give them a chance. And I'm, I'm happy that we've been able to do those things. Yeah, I love all of the work that you're doing within PCRM. I'm curious, what what is it like to sue the U.S. government? How do you even initiate that process? And it for me, it would seem like that's kind of a really daunting task. It's important. Um, when in 2000, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans were being reformulated, they had a committee that was the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. And if you looked at it, there were 11 people on it. Six had financial relationships with industry. That's not right. Now, we filed suit against the U.S. government because there are statutes that they violated. Um, we went to Fed, U.S. District Court um, in D.C. We had one lawyer. You know, the, the, the government <laughs> has a whole team of lawyers. But it helps if you're right. And so the judge looked at our lawyer and said, that's it. You're, you're absolutely right. The government was wrong. And so they've got to kind of fix that. And I have to say, ever since that time, the dietary guidelines have been pulled together in a transparent process. The industry is still there. I mean, they are like buzzards on a wire just waiting to, <laughs> to jump in and, and push their product. But um, the process has to be transparent. What the committee looks like has to be known to everybody. They, they have to share their evidence base. And bit by bit, it's, it's getting better and better and better. Not perfect, but much better. What are, what's the future of PCRM in your eyes? What are the big initiatives that you have on the horizon that you're working toward? Well, there's a number of things that have to be done. First of all, in the world of research, um, yes, we've shown really great things about what can happen in the body when we change the diet, but we need to do more. I would like to do more specific studies on how the body changes 
day by day when a person follows a plant-based diet as a treatment for diabetes. Um, we have shown in people who don't have diabetes that the fat that's built up in their muscle cells comes out. We need to show that clearly with people who've had long-standing diabetes and watch what happens in their bodies. And we need to do more of that. Partly, I have to say, we don't need to do that in order to establish what the best diet is. We know that. But we need to perhaps provide a little more technical understanding, perhaps for doctors and others who are a little bit skeptical of, can it really work to be eating all of this plant-based food and to actually lose weight and feel better? We also need to do more work um, on hormonal conditions. Um, we have done a lot on that already. Things like menstrual pain or menopausal symptoms. Um, our good friend Dean Ornish has done great work on prostate cancer, but there's more work to be done there as well. And then the big issue, of course, is educational programs. Um, for better or worse, Zoom has given us worldwide reach, which at first was annoying to be in these little rectangles, but now, <laughs> but now I think this is good. Um, so we're doing multilingual programs and really trying to get the word out, not only to people, say, in the U.S. who, who need this, but to people in other countries where much of this is still new. I love that. So 20 years ago in 2003, the NIH gave you a grant to research uh, for looking at conventional diets versus plant-based diets for type 2 diabetes. And the results of the plant-based diets, of course, were extraordinary. And the American Diet uh, Diabetes Association published your findings in 2006. So why do people still die, get their feet amputated, go through all of this insane conventional medicine instead of just changing their diet? You know, it's a tragic thing. One of my most unhappy memories, I have to say, when I was a medical student or an intern, there was a woman in the hospital with severe diabetes and she was there for a foot amputation. Her gangrene had threatened her foot and to save her life, we needed to amputate. She said, you can't do that. I'm keeping my foot. And we said, no, you're gonna die if, if we don't remove the gangrenous limb. She said, no, I'm not gonna do that. And so we said, well, the only other thing we can do is you stay in this bed, I'm gonna hook up an IV and you're gonna stay here for six weeks of just intravenous antibiotics. I'm gonna see if we can knock out that infection. And I gotta tell you, we were wrong. After six weeks, she was discharged with her foot still intact. But we were wrong in another way. During that whole time, nobody ever talked to her about reversing her diabetes through diet. It was still, what's your insulin dose today? Don't eat too much carbs. It was this just prehistoric approach to diet that I am quite sure meant that she lost that battle when she got out of the hospital. That was wrong. That was a mistake. But we can forgive ourselves because we didn't know then what we know now. And to this day, there are doctors, I hate to say it, maybe the majority, of doctors who are treating diabetes never talk with the patient about what caused it. They're not even aware of themselves. And they give them platitudes like, try to eat right, or don't eat anything white, you know, or th things like that, that that really don't get you where you need to go. Um, we need to change medical education. We need to insist that doctors practice in such a way that respects the patient. Um, don't push the pa don't put the patient down. The idea that, oh, the Patients are lazy. They don't want to. They don't want to stop uh, uh, their, you know, their meat and, and cheese and things. They'd rather pop a pill. Let me tell you something. There is not a patient in the world who wouldn't gladly take that sack of medications and throw it in the trash if they believed that diet could work for them. It's just a question of information and support. I just really struggle to understand how doctors who specialize in diabetes management do not read the literature or understand this. I guess you're still struggling with that question yourself. Well, we're, we're, don't get me wrong. We're still making progress. Um, the, American Di the American Diabetes Association did, in fact, publish our findings and, and I've presented at their meetings. And that's all great. But there's a lot of noise out there. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry promotes their products and they have got money to do it. And most of the continuing medical education that you see is funded by the pharmaceutical industry. 
free lunch. Um, Novo Nordisk is one example of, I mean, they, they make good, good drugs that should be used rarely, but they pay about $25 million a year to doctors. You can't pay a doctor to prescribe a drug, but you can pay a doctor to talk to their colleagues about a drug, to give a lecture at the medical school about the drug, to come to your meeting. And $25 million a year buys you a lot of loyalty. Yeah, that's criminal. So your latest book, Your Body and Balance, is all about the effect of our food choices on hormones. So not surprisingly, hormonal health and balance all comes back to a plant-based diet at the end of the day. But what about women who are already following a plant-based diet? What can they do best to navigate menopause? Okay, well, for, for menopause, I got to tell you, this is a totally new thing for us. I wasn't expecting to do the research that we ended up doing. What happened was there was evidence, a strong evidence, um, that women, say, in Asian uh, cities, um, Asian countries, in Japan in particular, back before the diet really westernized, there's no dairy in the diet back in, you know, in, in Tokyo in 1965, people weren't eating cheeseburgers. There was some meat, uh, some fish, but it was mostly rice, vegetables, um, and hot flashes were maybe 15% of women at menopause, and they were pretty mild. They, there wasn't even a word for hot flashes. And then as the diet westernized, things got worse and worse and worse and worse. So we had, I had written about this and a lot of other evidence. And in Your Body and Balance, I suggested that if a woman has hot flashes, it probably would be a good idea to follow a plant-based diet, keep the oils low, that would help you lose weight, that helps too, and to add soybeans, that should help. A, a woman named Betty got a hold of me. She said, Dr. Brando, I read your book. I did what you said and my hot flashes went away in three days. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> I thought it would help, but I didn't think it would help that fast or that much. She said, no, they're gone. And I said, well, tell me exactly what you did. And she said, well, I went totally vegan, no animal products, I kept oils really low, and I had a half a cup of soybeans every day. What brand? Laura brand. Where did you get them? I bought them on Amazon. How did you cook them? I put them in my Instant Pot. She told me exactly what she did. Hung up the phone, I ran into Dr. Kaliova's office, she's our research director, and I said, Hannah, we have got to test this because this could really be big stuff. So long story short, we tested her, exactly her diet and it knocks out moderate to severe hot flashes by 88%. That's like as good as hormone replacement therapy, except that it doesn't have the bad side effects. It's, it's got only good side effects. You know, you lose weight. So let's say a woman is already vegan. That's step one. Keep oils low. That's step two. So even things like avocado toast or, or peanut butter, which you know are much healthier than animal products. If a woman is suffering from hot flashes, I'd say keep all fats really, really low. You know, if you want to bring them back later, maybe so, um, because it's, I'm not saying an avocado is terrible, but for now, our research shows that keeping all fats low helps. And then the third thing is bring in soybeans. Soybeans have isoflavones. Isoflavones like genistein and daidzein um, seem to help and you put this, these three pieces together, each piece alone is part of it. Together, it is like a drug, and it really works well. Specifically, whole soybeans, or is tofu okay, soy milk, do this? Um, soy soybean? milk is okay, tofu, edamame is okay, but uh, what we think matters is the isoflavone content. So if I have a half, a half a cup of mature soybeans, they've got a lot more isoflavones than a half a cup of edamame. Edamame is the baby the baby soybean. You leave it, let it grow for a little longer and then it gets more isoflavone. And you need two quarts of soy milk to get the isoflavones that you would get in a half a cup of mature soybeans. So they're all good and, and they're all healthy and they all reduce cancer risk. They're, they're great in every way. But um, the mature soybeans is the one that's really loaded with the isoflavones. Great. So what about hypothyroidism? What can vegan men and women do to help um, navigate hypothyroidism? For hypothyroidism, we are really still at the frontier, I have to say. Um, we have some tantalizing leads, especially from the Adventist Health Study too. They looked at people who had hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and what they've showed is that it was 
least common in vegans, most common actually in dairy consuming vegetarians. Um, so people are consuming, they may not be having meat, but they're making up for it with cheese and so forth. And then for hyperthyroidism, which is Graves' disease, um, once again, lowest in vegans, but highest now in the omnivores. So we have suggested that people try, let, let's say a person is not yet vegan, um, but they've got hypothyroidism, try the plant-based diet that's associated with doing better. Let's see what happens. Um, and for some people, they get dramatically better. But I, I don't know how often that's the case. The other thing is um, your thyroid needs iodine. If it doesn't have iodine, you don't make thyroid hormone. And the most common source in an American diet is iodized salt. But we're modern people. We have sea salt or Himalayan salt or something like that. So it may not be iodized. So if you eat seaweed every day because you live in Japan, you're getting lots of iodine. But if you're in Omaha, you may not be. So it's good to make sure you have an iodine source as well. But vegan diet plus iodine, it looks like a pretty good treatment but no one has ever done a study bringing in 100 people with hypothyroidism and see if that regimen would help. Are you looking at conducting that study or you just would be very interested in seeing those findings if they were published? Uh, it would be great if somebody would do it. Um, every, every study is, um, that we do is a big thing, I have to say. Expensive. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, you know, they're all, they're all big, but I have to say they're important um, to do and I would like to see uh, where it goes. Um, some of the studies, like our menopause studies, were really quite quick and easy to do because, I mean, if you can cure hot flashes in six weeks, it, it, it does not take, you know, hundreds of people and 20 years to, to prove that it works. You can prove it very quickly. Do you have any tips for vegan women who have PCOS? Yeah. Um, polycystic ovary syndrome is, uh, it's a genetic condition. You're really born with it. And what it means is that a woman has a little bit extra male hormone in her body. Not a lot necessarily, but a little. You know, everybody's got both. Men have a lot of male hormones, testosterone and its relatives, and they have a little bit of female hormones, some estrogen. For women, the reverse is true. They've got a lot of estrogens and a little bit of, of the androgens. Um, but let's say you were born with just a little different balance. So you've got a touch more androgen. Uh, and a woman might have a little bit of chin hair or something like that, or um, it's just those androgens working their mischief. But as time goes on, um, women discover in some cases that their cycle is not behaving, uh, their fertility is not what they hoped it would be. And along with it comes insulin resistance. For some reason, their body is not letting their insulin do its job. So their blood sugars tend to rise, and it's very much like diabetes in a way. So uh, we have been encouraging people to use the diabetes diet for PCOS. And for some women, it is just an amazing life changer. They still may have PCOS, but they do really, really well with it. Let's talk a little bit about dietary fat intake. So I know in general, a lower fat intake, definitely keep the oils out. But do you have any... Would you put a number to a dietary fat intake that's optimal for hormonal health, maybe in terms of percentage of calories or grams per day? Do you make any of those kind of recommendations? And if so, do you have any? Um, everything is tentative because we're, we're always going by what our research shows. But for right now, I would recommend that a person aims for about maybe 10% of their calories to come from fat. Now, the truth is you don't need that much. Um, you need maybe three, four, five percent of your, your calories from the essential fatty acids. But getting down to 10 puts you in pretty rare territory compared to an American diet. Um, and to get there, the easy thing to do is to avoid animal products and to, to keep added oils to a minimum. And apart from that, there's just nuts and seeds and avocados, and that's kind of about it. Um, and if you're conscious about those things, you'll get there. And I, I, I do have to say that I don't think a nut is, is poison. Um, but when, I, when we're dealing with a hormonal issue, my goal usually is to cure the person first. And that's why I'm going to be a little stricter with them than I might be with somebody else. And so if you've avoided all the nuts and the nut butters and the oils and you feel terrific and you want to see how you do with bringing some almonds and walnuts back into your diet, go ahead. You know, see how you do. 
lots of people seem to promote a higher fat intake than that specifically for hormonal health but as you just said that's not necessary what would you say to a person who is plant-based and they are consuming a higher dietary fat intake from whole food sources such as nuts and avocados and they are feeling great do you think there's any negative consequences to consuming a higher fat diet, say on the range of 20 to 30%? If a person is doing that and they feel fine, um, it's hard for me to argue with them, I have to, t to tell you. <laughs> you know, um, my good friend Caldwell Esselstyn might say, you can't really see in their arteries. It could be that if they're adding oils, it could be that it's harming their arteries in such a way that they're not gonna be aware of it for another 20 years. I don't think he's wrong. Um, but on the other hand, the vegetable oils that we're consuming are so much healthier than animal fat, um, with a couple of exceptions. Coconut oil is marketed heavily, same with palm oil. They're high in saturated fat. They will raise your cholesterol. I don't care how much people market them. It's, it's a problem with it. And the, the, the issue is that it becomes a big fad. You go into the health food store now, you don't see soy milk anymore. You got to look around, you know, where is it? But you see coconut milk all over the place. Um, logic doesn't play a big role in, <laughs> in human behavior in general, um, but certainly not in what products are available, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a statement and unfortunately true. Let's talk a little bit about personal care products. I'd be interested in hearing if there are any substances in deodorants, shampoos, soaps, anything like that, that you are kind of looking out for? Or do you have any kind of tips to navigate that territory? I mean, there are all kinds of things. Um, for most of them, I don't think they're the big problem. Uh, what what really are the problems that Americans face are the things that we swallow because the, the exposures are huge. However, um, maybe one just to note is aluminum. And a number of years ago, I started to be concerned about diet and Alzheimer's disease and to look at the rather robust literature on dietary patterns that seem to be associated with reduced risk. And metals came into that equation. Yes, it's good to be plant-based. It's good to, to get away from animal products and so forth, for sure. But metals can come into our lives and can poison our brains. And aluminum is used in a lot of things, especially deodorants. So every day people get out of the shower and they put a deodorant all over their body. The aluminum goes into the blood, goes to the brain, and happens to be a neurotoxin. Now, there are people who say, oh, I, I, I think the research isn't really done. But in industrial accidents, when people have been exposed to aluminum, there, there's no question that's a neurotoxin. And secondly, your body does not need aluminum for anything. Your body uses some copper, some iron, some you know, other elements. It doesn't use aluminum for anything. So my thought is, while the research is going on, I'm going to avoid it. So if you get a deodorant that's got aluminum in it, um, trade it for one that doesn't. I mean, they're there on the shelf. Yeah, there are so many options for aluminum-free deodorant. I guess some others would be maybe aluminum foil. We take that out. Aluminum cookware. We also want to be careful about that. So basically anything that contains aluminum, let's try to keep it out of our, uh, out of our kind of personal care products and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, you get a good pan. There may be a, a layer of aluminum inside the pan, but if the outer layer is stainless steel, and even if, it, even if there's a non-stick coating on top, I think it's fine. I don't think there's any evidence of danger there. And if the aluminum is what's in touch with the food, I think that is a problem. So you've been vegan now for almost 40 years. I think it's mm -hmm. gonna be 40 years next year. And what would you say after everything you've been through is the best way to spread the vegan message? You know, everybody does this in a different way. Um, we, here, we use the things that we're able to do. You know, so we, if we have a, the capacity to do research studies and get them published, that's important for us. Um, if we have uh, uh, the ability to influence what the media reports on, that's important too. But there are many people who don't have those assets. You're worried about your mom and it's just you, um, or you're worried about your friends. And what I always encourage people to do is to share information. A lack of information is usually the biggest issue or, or misinformation. So if you give people a book, they're not going to read it. Um, it'll sit. I learned this from my own mother. My mom had a high cholesterol level. I kept giving her books. And you know how you can tell when a book has not been read? 
Hi, mom. Haven't seen you in six months. There's the book in the same place I left it. Yeah. So I, I learned you got to put a post-it note inside the book and another one, maybe two or three. And on the cover, you put a little note saying, mom, love you so much. And I thought of you on page when I was reading page 130 of Dean Ornish's book. She can't wait to tear the book open. She'll read it and she'll call you about a week later and she'll say, you know, I read that book three times. What was it that made you think of me when you read that? And I said, Mom, I just wanted you to read the book. <laughs> and I knew if I put that post-it in there, you couldn't resist it. You can do the same thing with a DVD or, or a movie. You know, you say, watch Game Changers or whatever it is. And between about 20 minutes and 47 minutes, that was you. They're going to watch that movie. They're going to slow it down. They're going to watch it again. They're going to tell their family, come watch this with me. There, there's something in here that they want me to look at because it was about them. Um, anyway, these are our little tricks of just getting people to pay attention a bit. Yeah, that's, those are some great tips. I, you bring up kind of talking with your family about the research you've done or about nutrition and stuff like that. What do you think your dad would say about the research you've done with diabetes specifically? You know, it's one of the, actually the saddest parts of my life was my poor dad would come home every day, six, six thirty, set down his bag, sit down. Never, ever did he say that somebody got better. No, and that wasn't the goal. The goal was to take this progressive disease and slow it down. So that instead of having a heart attack at 55, maybe you'd have it at, at 68 or 70. That was the goal. And that's not our goal now. I mean, our goal is to, to reverse this disease if we can, to, to help people to really live. And I've often thought if he had the tools that we have, he would have loved his practice. You could see it in his eyes every day. He'd come home, he's, you know, just this kind of feeling like there was another day in the trenches really trying to slay that dragon. And I think it would have just been a wonderful thing for him. Well, you've carried the torch for him, which is which is really amazing. So unfortunately, confusion sells in the world of nutrition and health and the meat and dairy industries use the same playbook as cigarette companies to spread confusion, even though we have so much of the scientific research from yourself and others. How do we put an end to this? Where how do we change that? First of all, you have to be right. Um, that's where research comes in. It's, you can't just have a dogma. It's got to be true. Um, so we do research studies. We do confirmatory studies. And, and other teams do the same. Then we have to get the word out to the profession because if a doctor thinks that a, a vegan diet will leave you weak or protein deficient, those, that's, that's headwinds you don't want to fight. But then after that, you got to be loud. And when I say loud, I mean you've got to find every way to get the word out that you can. Um, and social media allows us to do that in a good way, but there's a lot of confusion on social media too. So you have to just make sure that you are the best on, on social media. You're the most persistent. You have things that people will grab onto, things that capture their attention. Um, and that's happening. Um, that's happening in a big way. And part of it is that the health benefits that people will get. The other part of it is, is, for want of a better word, just the culinary benefits. Really? I can have French toast with blueberries and cinnamon on top, and that's healthy for me? Yeah, it is. You know, and all the great products that are out nowadays and so forth. So you wet people's appetites, you seduce them through the stomach. Um, all, there are all the, many ways to get people's attention. Yeah, being right, being loud, I think those are yeah certainly two important things. And I've really been impressed by the amount of content that you and PCRM have been putting out, uh, especially over the past few years. I had some I spent some time with Chuck Carroll yesterday and he's an awesome guy, such a great interviewer. And it's really cool, all the work that you guys are doing. So you founded the Barnard Medical Center in 2016. Could you share more about what you do at the center and maybe share some success stories that have really inspired you? Yeah, sure. Um, the Barnard Medical Center was really set up as kind of a laboratory to just see, OK, we've proved things in research study. How is it going to work for the doctor in the exam room with the patient? And about half the patients come in because they've heard of us and they know that here's a doctor who's, who knows about vegan diets and can talk intelligently about them. The other half of the patients come in with no clue about that. We're on their insurance plan. 
So they've got a urinary infection or a sore ankle and they come in and what? The doctor wants to not only treat my urinary tract infection, but then also wants to ask me about what I've been eating. Um, and that's what our doctors do. And so what we do is, is the same as what we do in research studies. We talk to the patients about foods, how foods can help them. Your sore ankle is going to get better. Your heart is going to get worse unless we change your diet. Okay, fine. You get their attention. You talk through how they can do better. They're still skeptical. So then the doctor hands things off to the dietitian. And it only takes a couple of minutes for a doctor to say, here's how a diet can bring your cholesterol down or whatever it is. The dietitian then sits down with the patient and his reluctant spouse, you know, they, they sit down together and think, oh, what am I going to eat now? And then they just start talking about what a healthy diet could be in practical terms. They get pumped up and you say, let's, let's meet again in a week. And the patient comes back in and then that's when we do our three-week test drive. And it's amazing to see people coming in thinking they were just going to walk home with a prescription to take to CVS. And instead, they've walked home with something that's going to change their life. I love the work that you're doing in in that respect. And I wish more doctors practiced medicine in that way. What is your favorite personal kind of personal favorite form of fitness? What do you do to stay kind of active and fit? Yeah. Um, the thing I prefer to do is I like to run about three days a week. Now, Jim Loomis, our medical director, always says, Neil, you can do it every day. But <laughs> I, I, always feel, I always feel like for me, three days a week is good or, or not three days, uh, not three days. A week, it's usually like every other day, just regardless of the day of the week. And for me, the amount I really like is just about 5K. It's not a lot. Um, but if I'm kind of not, if I haven't been doing it for a while, I start slow and I get there. And if I'm, if I'm running 5K three days a week, I feel like, all right, that's good for my brain. However, my inner competitive spirit kind of comes out and says, 5K, that's just a fun run. I mean, you know, why don't you do more than that? And so um, because running for me is sometimes a little painful after a while, um, I always listen to something when I'm doing it. And then I'm kind of in heaven, I got to say. I just really enjoy. I get up early in the morning. I don't eat breakfast. And I go out and I run. I don't care what the weather's like. Um, just go out and run and listen to something and usually a language tape or something like that. Probably doing my brain some good there too. Um, that's it. Yeah. Running is amazing. That's how I got started in fitness, did cross country and, and all that. Yeah. Dr. Loomis has done, he's an Ironman triathlete. Hey, don't so, rub it in. You get, is the, <laughs> exactly. Is he, uh, he was 60 years old out there doing the triathlon. Yeah. You know, the, oh my God. Yeah. So he's not going to get you to do one anytime soon? Uh, maybe for my 80th birthday, I'll follow him, but we'll see. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. The competition at that age tier is, is uh, a little easier. So that's right. There are a lot of people doing it at that point. We'll, we'll, I'll yeah, let you you know. can come out and just win your first one in your age group. So you said before that you are eternally an optimist. Where does this optimism come from? And how do you seem to have a limitless supply of it despite all of the forces you're battling? Well, Maybe a better word than optimist really is, comes from uh, when, when the League of Nations was established after World War I, and Europe was just in shambles, uh, diplomats decided we needed to create a way to solve conflicts without war. And they set up the League of Nations, kind of the, the forerunner of the UN. And somebody asked the, the organizer, of, one of the chief organizers, said, are you an optimist? Or are you a pessimist? He said, well, I'm determined. And I've always remembered that because let's face it, we've got the whole deck is stacked against us in, in, in some ways. People are short-sighted in some cases, um, prone to addictions and all kinds of problems. And, and our bodies will let us down even when we take good care of them sometimes. But we have everything on our side. We have a very powerful diet for health. The very same diet is the best favor you could ever do for this planet that we live on. And when I think about the cows who were on our farms growing up and, and the ducks and geese that we killed flying out of Cal, uh, Canada over North Dakota, I think I'm going to do you a favor too. And to the extent that this world is both healthy, compassionate, and, and also forward thinking, if we can put all those together, it's the best prescription, not just for those of us who are here now, 
but the next generation that's coming up. You know, look at what parents will do for their children. They'll think about their college education when the kid is still in diapers. <laughs> they're, th they're thinking about their morals. They're thinking about what are they seeing on the screen. And this is a time when the world is tough for kids. It's tough for their parents. There are so many challenges we face. But when you've got a diet that worked for you, that's going to help you to heal, that diet can protect your kids to an extent against the challenges that are going to hit them once they start going through the cafeteria in junior high and in high school. And it doesn't get better for them. If we don't take that in our hands, we're condemning our kids to repeat what's happened to too many in our generation. A high intake of omega-3 fats has been linked to an increased risk of developing prostate cancer. What are your thoughts about supplementing algae oil to get mm -hmm. preformed EPA and DHA? You know, this, this is one of the really, I think, important questions where I don't know that the answers are entirely clear. When researchers discovered that people who had really low blood levels of DHA and EPA were probably at higher risk for Alzheimer's, people said, well, let me supplement it. And then studies started to show that men who supplemented with DHA, EPA, had higher rates of prostate cancer. And at first it looked like a fluke. But the finding is so consistent that it, even though we don't know the mechanism, it's just so consistent that I'm a believer in that. So where are we now? I don't think we know the answer to that. So until more definitive studies come in, I think it's a mistake to recommend that everybody supplement with these things. Now, now, some people may choose to, and if they do, uh, a sensible thing to do is you can test. You can get a little test kit and do a little finger stick and send your uh, little blood sample into Omega Quant or one of the other companies that will tell you how much, what your DHA blood level is. And if you're really low, you can decide I might supplement. Um, I'm hoping that in 10 or 15 years we'll be smarter than we are today and that we'll know the answer to that question. I do have to say, if people really ate simple foods like broccoli and other green vegetables, they don't have a lot of fat in them, but what they have is proportionately really high in omega-3. And the proportion is what really matters. So it may be that this whole question will be moot. And if we're answer, if following a really healthy diet, the supplements might kind of fall by the wayside. So your perspective is to just focus on consuming wholesome sources of ALA, focusing on just making sure you have a healthy diet and then limiting your intake of omega-6. And then as That's long exactly as we right. do that, we should be in good shape. Yeah, you know, you, you want to get the, the omega-3 you need, and that's ALA, but you want to diminish the competitors that are tying up the enzymes that would lengthen the ALA. Okay, great. So as I touched on, you've been vegan now for almost 40 years, and I, I just want to say I really respect and appreciate that you also talk about the ethical side of veganism which is, uh, and not just focusing on plant-based nutrition, because I think that the whole picture is really important to share with people. I would like to hear how has being a more vocal vegan doctor, has that given you any kickback from people who would say that your research or studies or anything is biased based on kind of your own agenda? Um. I wouldn't say that we've gotten much kickback because what we do is very careful, but, but it's important to acknowledge that everyone does have biases. If people are going to test any kind of diet or any kind of supplement or whatever, even if it's something where they're not generating income, um, they always have a bias. They want their theory to work out. So in any research study, you have to correct for that. Um, and so you have a control group. You have to treat, you know, for example, we're using a vegan diet versus a a Mediterranean diet or a low calorie diet, some kind of comparison group. You have to treat them equally. You have to get an institutional review board to look at your plan and approve it. You have to stick to it. You have to publish your results in a peer reviewed journal where you will get torn apart um, to make sure that what you did is honest. And then you hope that other people will do the same thing you did and replicate it. Luckily, that's what's happened. Um, Biases aren't always bad. When tobacco was first being examined as a cause of lung cancer, a century ago, basically, um, people could be even-handed. I'm not sure if lung cancer is related to tobacco or not. And by the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was absolutely clear. 
That didn't mean that tobacco research st- stopped. It didn't mean that, that, that people didn't want to study it anymore. And everybody had a bias that tobacco was a carcinogen. You can't set that aside and say, I'm going to pretend that it doesn't. But what you have to do is to study things in a careful way. So in our work, it is beyond question that getting the cholesterol out of your diet, getting animal products out of your diet, it's going to lower your cholesterol. It's going to help you lose weight. It's good in all those ways. You can't pretend you don't know that anymore. But if we're studying something like the effect on the thyroid, you start fresh and you do your research in a good way. Yeah, that's a really important and interesting point in that bias is not always a bad thing. And sometimes that can fuel just further developments in a really positive direction. Yes, so, but it has to be controlled for. It has to be, um, you, you have to set up your studies in, in a good way. And, um, and you, you just have to do the best work that you possibly can. Um, I don't take any money. We don't take any money from the food industry. I don't take a salary from this organization. Um, we do our best to, to, <laughs> to do as clean a work as we possibly can. Yeah, I, and I really appreciate that. So you get a lot done. Uh, You're a professor of medicine. You're constantly writing new books. You're the founder of the Barnard Medical Center. You're the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. You write music. You play in a band. You travel and speak. You publish a lot of content. So I'd really love to hear how do you get it all done? How do you kind of structure your schedule to be so productive? Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. I never really feel that way. I always feel like there's a whole lot more that I really want to get yeah, done or, or, you know, why did it take me, uh, you know, so long to finish that book or whatever? Um, well, I guess I have certain assets. I, I don't have kids, <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm not forking out money for kids' student loan. Um, so I'm kidding a little bit, you know, but, yeah. but those things are helpful. Uh, also, we have a really good team here at the Physicians Committee. So if, if we're doing a research study, it is not me alone doing that work. I, I play a role in them, but we have a really good team that gets a lot of things done. And also, um, if there's, when I write a book, it's for a reason. It's because we found something that I thought people need to know about this. You can control your insulin. Uh, you can control your estrogens. You can t- control testosterone production based on what you eat. Good heavens. So, you know, you want to write a book and you get excited about it. And so you spend your time cranking it out. You spend your time reading. You have to be careful. You have to read a lot of the literature and so forth, but you just get these things done and work as hard as as you can. Um, The other thing I have to do for me is you have to be willing to be wrong um, or or be willing to be not exactly right. So I'll, I'll do the best article I can or something, but then you give it to other people and say, what am I missing? What's wrong here? And the same is true in music. You know, you say, here is something I've composed. I think this is killer. This is great. But then you give it to your violinist or your bass player, and they're going to say, wait, wait, let me show you something. And they'll add their part. And this kind of stone soup that you've created really becomes so enriching. And so you, you want to make sure that you're not always right. Because if you are, you're going to, nothing's going to be better than what you've created. Let other people bring what they have to offer to what you're doing. That's what we do here at the Physicians Committee. If you look at um, our research director, Dr. Kaliova, look at Jim and Venita in in the clinic. These are clinicians and scientists who just have a huge knowledge base of their own, and and I'm their student. I love that. So you're a phenomenal musician. You're a really talented guitarist. How has your passion for music influenced your work in the field of medicine and advocacy for plant-based nutrition and veganism? You know, it's a funny thing, you know, when I write, I, I started in music when I was just a little kid because it was my parents' idea, really. <laughs> you know, our kids must have piano lessons and cello and all that kind of stuff. And so when I would do music, it's, it was really mostly because it was something I wanted to do. It was something I wanted to hear. And it wasn't to try to change the world. Um, I'm at the beach and I'm closing my eyes and I'm envisioning a song that hasn't been done or a piece of music that's adventurous or or beautiful or aggressive or something. And then you write it down, you, you make it happen. Um, but then when it comes to the lyrics on it, if I'm gonna add lyrics or create a video, that's when your left brain <laughs> comes in and starts saying, what do I wanna say? I mean, in words. 
And that's where the desire to kind of change the world comes in a little bit. And for me as a musician, I don't want to be too pedantic about it. You don't want somebody to, to, to be like the coffeehouse hippie poet who's boring everybody with their view of the world. But on the other hand, um, if there's a way to say things that touch the heart, that to me is important. Um, and I think some of our music has done that. Uh, the band Carbon Works that I work with is just some terrific people. And, and I th think, at least I hope, that some of the music does that. You're all very talented. So if we stopped consuming animal protein in this country overnight, how much do you think our health care and pharmaceutical costs would drop over the next decade? Oh, my goodness sakes. Um, a couple of numbers. I'm going to suggest <laughs> that you know, one of the most popular drugs now is Lipitor and, and everything else in that statin class. And I'm going to guess that about 90% of people taking Lipitor do not need it or, or would not need it if they weren't eating the foods that were driving their cholesterol up. I would say for high blood pressure, the figure might be similar. Um, and for something like diabetes, we're not going to eliminate it all. But if I could wave a magic wand and have everybody eating a plant-based diet that was healthy and natural, as natural as possible, you would prevent the vast majority of cases of type 2 diabetes, probably type 1 as well, in certain cases, although we still need more research there. Hypertension, cholesterol, we would cut cancer rates in half. The cost, I mean, it's a big it number. would drop <laughs> phenomenally. I mean, you're talking trillions of dollars of savings. And not to mention the real cost, which is families being torn apart by illness. We're not going to live forever, but why give up the struggle in such a, a sad and, and difficult way early on in life? You've always stood out to me as someone who leads a very fulfilling and purposeful life. And I'd love to hear what advice would you go back and give your younger self? Hmm. <laughs> what would I tell my younger self? I don't know. I think I wasted a lot of time to tell the honest truth. Um, when, I, when I was a kid, you know, I used to just you know, watch television, do things that, that really weren't so helpful. And, and when I was in school, many of the things that we, that we learned in, in school didn't really make us a whole lot smarter. Now, yeah, I mean, you know, having analytic geometry and calculus might have been useful, but I can't say I've ever really used it, um, either one. So in many ways, I wish that I had been aware of maybe the state of the world a little bit earlier on. Um, and had embraced that and learned the things more about the things that I'm doing now. My father didn't encourage me to go into medicine at all. Um, he I just had his own view of why he was doing this and didn't particularly think this was something we should necessarily pursue. Um, and medicine is boring in many ways uh, for a lot of doctors. Okay, here's the patient's condition. Here's my cookbook response. Here's your prescriptions. Go to the, the pharmacy. Um, when you discover how to do it the right way and how to really make it a collaboration between you and the patient, it is the most fulfilling thing that you can imagine. And if my younger self could have seen that, what it really means to put your knowledge to work to benefit those patients. And beyond that, it's not just the patient, it's their family. You know, practicing medicine the way my dad did, no patient ever came home with an insulin prescription and said, look what I brought home. I've got insulin. Anybody want to try some? Who wants to line up for it? I mean, no, it doesn't happen. When you teach people about a healthy diet, traverse their disease, do you think they keep that to themselves? No, they come in the front door and they say, I just got this new lasagna recipe. Who wants to try it? I'll try. You change the whole culture for them and not just for their family, but for their community. And here in Washington, DC, if you look across this city, there are places of affluence where disease rates are somewhat lower because people have more resources. There are other places where the disease rates are much higher because people have fewer resources, less access to knowledge and the tools that could take care of themselves and their families. That has got to stop. And the way that is going to stop is by not just relying on drugs and surgery and treatments after the fact, but to help good food to be present everywhere and the knowledge on how to use it and the encouragement and the support 
what I'm saying is that you can help the person, you can help their family, you can help their community, you can dissolve disparities, you can do all these things that are sort of massive political goals, but you can do this simply as a health professional who understands the cause of disease. I love that. And I really appreciate everything that you have done for the world of plant-based nutrition, for the vegan movement. You've inspired me and millions of other people. So I just really appreciate everything that you've done. What can our listeners do to best support your work? Oh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for asking. Um, I think the, the best thing is to just um, remember that we're all in a relay. Somebody's going to hand you something. If you can grab it in your hand and carry it to the next person, that's what gets the job done. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate sure. it. Well, thank you. And good luck with what you're doing. You are reaching so many people. You've got a really important message. And I appreciate your bringing that to people who need it. Thank you.